Welcome to the Community Foundational Next World Training of March 2024. This is going to be a two-day training starting today on March 5th and it goes until tomorrow. This is the page of the event where you can have more information about it. It's going to take about three or four hours on the first day. These are topics that we want to cover. We will start with the slide deck, giving an introduction to Nextflow and then F-Core. Then we have a getting started with Nextflow section. And finally, we will start doing some hands-on by developing from scratch a proof of concept rna seq pipeline. After that, we're gonna go uh, have a look about how to manage the, the software dependencies and also how to containerize your applications, the applications that you're going to use in your pipeline. And for the end of today, we're gonna go through uh, an overview of the Groovy programming language, which can be useful when you're writing your next flow pipelines. So the goal of this first day is that by the end of it, you will be able to write your own next flow pipelines, simple pipelines, but still functional ones. The proof of concept rna -seq pipeline has multiple steps with containers, uh, with Conda environment if you desired, with uh, real data and some interesting results. I mean, not really results that are insightful, but there are some output. So with that, you can just port this knowledge to write your own pipelines that could be much larger and more complex and so on. For the second day tomorrow, you're going to go through this schedule here with Chris Hackard. So you're going to learn about channels, processes, and operators, which are the three uh, primitives of Nextflow. It's very important to, to master these three concepts. Then you will also learn about how to write modules, how to make your Nextflow pipeline more modular. You're going, to, you're going to be introduced to configurations and different deployment scenarios and cache and resume, troubleshooting. And for the last section, you will learn about secure platform. So this is the schedule for the two days. They will both have each about three to four hours uh, duration. And having said this, uh, if you have any question, you can go to the NF Core Slack, for, to the training channel. So basically you can go here about, join NF Core. I'm gonna open a new tab. And here you're gonna have this link to go to Slack, right? Inside NF Core Slack, you should go to the training channel and ask your questions there. And there should be people there to answer your questions and and help you with the training. Here you can see the code of conduct that you should abide in order to participate uh, in the training. And let's go now to our slide deck. So again, welcome to this uh, training, training session. We're gonna go at the beginning, we're gonna cover some concepts and some background knowledge for you to understand more about pipelines and, and the reason for Nextflow to, to exist. So the concept of workflow, it's basically using computers to collect, store, analyze, and disseminate data and information. So you have some input data, you want to do something with that, some transformation, run some uh, methodologies on top of that. And at the end, you, you expect to have some output that you want to have as a result for your pipeline. Not every output, is desirable in the, in the end. Maybe you just want to pick some of the output files, but still your pipeline is supposed to be an input, do some transformation and get an output. The first thing that's interesting to mention here is that depending on, on where you're coming from on, on your field, you could have inputs that are very different. You could have a lot of very small files, you could have a lot of large files, or you could have a mix of them. Some small files, some large files and so on. In some, in some scenarios, you could even have like one single file, which is very large, which is not uncommon in data science. But when it comes to bioinformatics, usually you have a lot of files in which many of them are very large. In this case here, we have as an example, one raw human genome having over 100 gigabytes of disk space being used. In these pipelines, it's not uncommon that you have many different programming languages. Uh, in each step of your pipeline, you could have Python scripts or R scripts or Bash scripts or Perl scripts. You could also have some MATLAB scripts. You could have compiled programs. So usually you, you are going to have a pipeline that's very heterogeneous in terms of, of technologies that among the multiple steps that it will have, different technologies will be used to run these steps. 
and also the interaction between these softwares and libraries and other configuration in your operating system, they can be quite complex. So these three things together, they describe reasonably well what these pipelines are, what they consist of and, and, and what they do, and also showing how, how, how complex it, it could be to have these pipelines with so many different technologies and complex, inter complex interactions in large files and so on. And by thinking about it, it, it brings the topic of reproducibility because the, the more complex your pipeline is, the more difficult it is to, to repeat the steps in any other machine and to reproduce the same results. Uh, in, in today, actually what happens is that any simple pipeline is already composed of so many different softwares on top of different libraries and other softwares that reproducibility becomes really a difficult thing to achieve. We have this mentioned here from, from this experimenting with reproducibility, a case study of robustness in bioinformatics paper by Kim et al, uh, where the authors were saying that first they tried to rerun the analysis with the code and data provided by the authors, but second, they just re-implemented the whole method in a Python package, because just trying to repeat what the authors did wasn't good enough, it wasn't working. And as I said, even simple pipelines, it can get quite complex if you take into consideration uh, the data, the software that are used, the interaction between them, the dependencies, and so on. So here we have this metro plot of the NF Core Eager pipeline. Uh, you have the legend here on the right, but basically every uh, line of these is, is one of the input files. Oops, one of the input files through the steps where you have sometimes multi output intermediate steps, which are the circles with the black border. You have input files entering different stages. You have conditions in which some tools are sometimes used or not. And this is a relatively simple pipeline. It can get much more complicated than that. So talking about these primitives that I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the schedule of the training, there are these three concepts that is very important that you understand. The first one is the process. So every step of the pipeline usually consists of a process. So if your pipeline gets the input data, that's one thing, other thing, then another thing, these things, these transformations, they're actually next row processes. You can think of them as boxes where something is getting in and then after some transformation, something is getting out. When you have these boxes, these steps, you want them actually to communicate. You want the data to get to go inside one box, something happens, it goes out, but then it goes in the next box and so on. These uh, ways in which these boxes communicate, it's what we call next row channels. And whenever you have next row processes connected by next row channels, we can say you have a workflow, a next row workflow. Visually, that's actually how it happens because a, a next row channel is just a queue, a first in, first out data structure in which every input file or every string, depending on how the data is handled, is a channel element. Here we have on the left some files, some data files, and we make use of an XLow channel factory, which is a special function to create channels. And by using this, this function, our data is going to be organized inside this input channel in which each file is a channel element. When we have this channel, we can provide it as an input to the next process. And that's what we see here. The thing is, the process is just a receipt. And whenever there's some input data, it's going to create an instance of a process, which is what we call a task. And depending on how you configure your, your next flow orchestration, it could happen that if you have three input files in your channel, it will automatically create three tasks that will be run in parallel at the same time. That's what we see here. The same time, each of these channel elements goes to a different uh, task, some transformation is done, and then we have some output. Here we have output X, Y, and Z from the inputs data Y, data X, data Z. And actually when the, the tests are over, Nexo is going to get these outputs and put them back in the channel, which is the output channel. And by having this, it's ready to be the input channel for the next process and so on, or being the final result of your pipeline. So, but what are, how are these processes written? How are they visually, let's say in terms of code? So let's, let's think about FastQC, for example. It's a very common software in bioinformatics for quality control. 
So usually what you have is some input file and you're going to run in the command line, the command fastqc space dash q space, the name of the file. This in the next process would basically be that. You have the process block, you give a name to it. Here we are giving the name fastqc. We, there's an input block where we say, what is, what is this process supposed to expect as an input? Here we are saying it's a path and whatever is provided as a path, we're going to refer to that through the variable called input. It could be a name. As output, we are also saying this process is expecting as output a path. So it could be a file or a folder. And then we, we give here a shell globbing saying, you know, whatever ending with underline fastqc uh, underscore fastqc dot either zip or HTML, I want this to be the output. And it's important, it's important to understand it here because some programs, they, they are going to create a lot of different files, error files, log files, intermediate files, folders, results, and so on. And sometimes you don't want all of this to go to the next process or to be stored or to be taken into consideration. You just need like the real, the actual result file. So that's what the output block does. Even though there's a lot of output from this transformation, you're saying, next row, just pay attention to these ones because I want these ones to be sent to the next process or as a result. So that's what's happening here. And the third block that we see is a script block, which tells what the process is supposed to do. So we have this multi-line string with three double quotes, whatever is inside is going to be run. And here you can see that the input that the, the process is expecting to receive, it's referred at the bottom by using the dollar sign. So here we are saying whatever is given as an input to FastQC, which is the path, I want this path to be provider, to be provided to the FastQC command. At the end, we need a workflow block. And this is what actually going to tell Nextflow what is supposed to happen. Because a process is just a description of a process, and that's it. it nothing happens. You, you're just describing it. But in the workflow block, you are saying when to call this process, how, and so on. So here we are using a channel dot from path, channel factory, which is a function that creates a channel based on the path. We're, go, we're, we're giving this path, which is every file in the current directory ending in dot fastq dot gz. We're going to create this channel in which every channel element is a file that matches this, this expression. And then we're going to call the fastqc process, which means an instance of this process, a task, is going to be created for every channel element from this channel that we just created. So there's some very interesting benefits from using these channels, operators, channel operators, workflows. By using the, the, the data flow paradigm, by using Nextflow as a language, you get some free benefits. Uh, a very famous one is the parallelism. It's what we call them implicit parallelization because you don't even have to know what parallelization is. Just by writing Nextflow code, Nextflow will automatically try to parallelize uh, your tasks, which means the same process is going to create multiple instances that are going to be run at the same time and so on. That's what it's illustrated here by these multiple arrows. Another interesting thing is the resume feature or reentrancy, which means that if you have multiple steps in your pipeline and you don't want to rerun things, like half the pipeline has already been run, you can use the resume that, uh, flag and next we will start from where it stopped. There are multiple different reasons for why this is an awesome feature. One of them is when you are developing your pipeline, you're developing it one step at a time. You create a step, you test, everything's fine. Then you add a new step, you test, it's fine. Then you, you add a new step, you test, it's fine. And you keep doing that until you're done and all your steps, they run successfully. The thing is, let's say that every step takes like 10 minutes. You'd run the first step once, it was working great, 10 minutes. Now you add another step, you run it again, now it's 20 minutes, 10 plus 10. Okay, but you already knew the first step was working, but still have you, right? That's life. So you go to the third step, now it's 30 minutes. So you already spent 60 minutes, 30, 20, and 10 to test these three steps. By using resume during pipeline development, what happens is that you run the first time, the first step, 10 minutes. The second one, it's just 10 minutes because it's gonna take advantage of the cache for the first step and it won't run the process again. The third one, just 10 minutes again, because the first and the second step is already cached. So this is a great example of the reentrancy feature for development, but it also, it's also very good for, for daily operations. Let's say you have this pipeline taking like 10 days to finish. 
and when it was very close to finish, there was a power outage or something happened in the server, some bug, something that was out of your control, or maybe there was a bug you left there. You go there, you fix it, and you run with the resume option that will restart from where it errored, it stopped. Without that, it would have to run everything again. You would need one, other, one extra week. When we think about clusters like shared computing or cloud computing, it, it shows really how troublesome this is because it may take a long time to, to your job to be run again or spending money that you have to spend again because it failed for the first time. Another thing is about reusability that whenever you have an extra pipeline, you can share a workflow as a sub workflow, which means anyone can easily copy paste your code is gonna work for them. It's very modular and easy to, to, to take code from people and people taking code from you. You can have processes as modules, which are very easy to share with other people, but also a set of, of modules, set of uh, processes, which will be a sub workflow. So it's been clear so far that next is a language we have this language based on Groovy, which is known as Python for Java. So everything written in Java or Groovy and any library can be used in Nextflow. So it's a language, uh, it's clear by now, we have these primitives, these Nextflow processes, Nextflow channels, Nextflow uh, workflows, and so on, so workflows. But also Nextflow is a runtime, which means Nextflow is a program called Nextflow that will orchestrate your Nextflow pipelines. So we have both a language in a runtime. And also a huge community, right? I'm going to talk about NF Core soon, which is a large part of the Nextflow community. But there's plenty of very interesting people doing amazing work, contributing to different tools that can make your life easier when writing Nextflow pipelines. So, <coughs> as I showed earlier, you can write code in any language because between the the multi uh, line strings, the three double quotes, you can put anything there. Some programs. Bash, uh, Python, R, MATLAB, Perl, whatever you want to write there, you can. So Nextflow doesn't care about the programming language you're using. It's just inside the Nextflow process. You orchestrate this task with data flow programming, which is this par programming paradigm about having queues and so on that makes it very easy for Nextflow to automatically parallelize your code. You can define software dependencies via containers. So you can use uh, Singularity, Docker, Podman, Charlie Cloud, and other container technologies to containerize the tasks of your pipeline to make sure they are very isolated and thus uh, reproducible. But you could also use SPAC or Conda to help you manage the installation of programs, both by just by themselves or also inside uh, containers. And then you also have some beauty version control uh, support that makes it very easy to integrate Git repositories with your Nextflow pipeline. Basically, what this means is that if you have an Nextflow pipeline on GitHub, you can just run Nextflow run and the URL of the repository, and Nextflow will be like we'll download, we'll pull the repository, download everything, organize in your computer, and run the pipeline. And also, a very important thing is where will you run your pipeline, the, the computer environment, right? It could be locally on your desktop but it could also be on Kubernetes, on, on the cloud with AWS or Azure or Google Cloud Platform. It could be uh, in a shared computing like a cluster with Slurm or PBS Turkey and so on. So this support that Nextflow has, has with all these technologies means that you can write your pipeline in your local computer, in your desktop, you test it, everything is fine. And very easily you can activate this to support any of these platforms, meaning that you can run them on AWS, on AWS or, or Turkey or Slurm or Kubernetes, and it's going to be fine. Because Nextflow has this layer, this abstraction layer, that allows the same pipeline to be run in different places. So with that, we have reproducibility, this integration with code management tools, version releases, and so on. Uh, you have this portability because by using Conda or other containers, you, you make sure what's running on your computer is going to run very similarly, if not the same, in other computers. You also have scalability, which is very interesting because you can play with the pipeline when you're developing it in your laptop with five samples. And if it works, it's going to be just the same with a 5,000 sample on an HPC, a high compute, uh, a high, uh, a cluster, a supercomputer, something like this, or also in a cloud with 5 million samples, it's going to be the same. Another interesting thing is that this, uh, this open source projects like Nextflow, they're very interesting because you can check the source code, you can contribute, you can do lots of different things, it's very nice, 
but at some point they become so large that to contribute code it, it becomes very complex. So there's something that you would like Nextbox to have, but it doesn't. And I mean, it's not so straightforward for you to just go there in a day and contribute uh, this new feature. So what we created was a plugin system so that it's very easy for you to create a plugin and then it's very easy to add this functionality to Nextflow. Here we have one example, which is NF validation, which is a plugin to nat natively handle schema files. So to validate that the inputs that you're receiving are the inputs that you should receive that the pipeline is expected to receive. With that, we have parameter validation, we have sample sheet validation, and we even have a channel factory, which is from sample sheet, to make it easy for you to create next channels out of sample sheet files. Here you have the URL for, for the, the, the documentation and, and, the, and the project on GitHub. Having said all this, in terms of what Nextflow is, why it's important, we need reproducibility, not only in science, but in industry, it's becoming uh, a very uh, uh, wish uh, functionality. We have at some point realized that we could benefit from not only a great technology like Nextflow, but also uh, a curated set of analysis pipelines and best practices and tools to help you develop your Nextflow pipeline. Around that, uh, around, uh, in 2018, the, the NFCore community was created. And right now it's huge. It has over 8,000 Slack users with thousands of GitHub contributors, a lot of GitHub repositories, thousands and thousands of GitHub commits for requests, issues, and so on. So it's a community inside the Nextflow community, but it's a very large one. And of course, came with some principles that are very interesting, and we have benefited a lot through time uh, from these principles. So the main one is develop with the community. So instead of people being isolated in their institutions, writing code, writing their next world pipelines, we invite everyone to get together and develop with us so that it's we can help you with the best practices and so on. We worked on a common template to make sure everyone is starting from the same thing so that when you need help, I already know the terrain so that I can help you better. Uh, there's also this very important uh, uh, thinking about trying not to duplicate pipelines within NFCore. So if you want to donate a pipeline to NFCore, for example, I'm going to talk more about this in the next slide. And we already have an actual pipeline that does exactly the same thing. We will not accept that because we have people almost like employed to keep track of these pipelines, make sure they are working and up to date. We spend lots of money that we got for the sponsorship by Microsoft Azure and, and AWS. So a lot of money is being spent in, in, in time to make sure everything works. And it will make sense to have two pipelines that do mostly the same thing being maintained. So we go with this no duplication of pipelines within NFCore. We also created many helper tools that makes it easy for you to, to actually it's like the NFCore tools, but it does a bunch of stuff in terms of sub workflows and and pipelines and modules and so on to make it easier for you not only to write Nextflow pipelines, but also to write good Nextflow pipelines with the best practices and so on. Uh, this idea about compatibility. So we want these tools to work in for any Nextflow pipeline and also to 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 modernize things in a way that you, you have these components that are very easy for you to contribute, like the plugin system. You don't have to learn or understand the whole pipeline. You could contribute a module, which is a process and a step of a pipeline, right? With that, we have right now almost a hundred different pipelines. And I come back again with the idea of no duplication. So 95 pipelines means that we have 95 different pipelines doing different types of analysis. It's a huge number if you stop for a second and think about it. We don't repeat the same analysis. So it's a huge number of analysis that we are covering with these pipelines. We have over 50 sub workflows, which are this smaller workflows that do something that is common to many different pipelines. So you could think of quality control, for example, a lot of different pipelines in genomics, they would do very similar quality control. So we have a sub workflow for that, which means that you can use the NF core tools with one command to insert that in your pipeline. And then you don't have to write code, like the whole code anymore for all these different steps. You just take advantage of the sub workflow that is already written. When it comes to modules, which are these software wrappers, we have over a thousand modules, which means there are about something like a thousand different uh, tools 
that you don't have to write the process for them to use on Nextflow. You can just import these modules and they are ready and tested and working for you to use for your pipeline step. We have some linting uh, features in the FCore tools to make sure that you're following the conventions and it's consistent and everything's right. We also have a schema to do validation and channel and, you, and we even have a user interface so that you can easily with your mouse play with the, 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 param the parameters and the inputs and so on for your pipeline. And also some tooling to develop and deploy these Nextflow pipelines in different places. So the idea here is you can create these pipelines from a common template, which makes it easier for you for us to provide support. You can, with the Nextflow tools, create, install, and update subworkflows. You can create, install, update, patch, test modules. So the idea of patch is having a different version of a, of a module that you want to add something or change something. And tests are unit tests that you can create or make use if they're already created to make sure the module is working. The schema has a, a GUI, so you can very easily with your mouse and your browser uh, make this relatively annoying but very important uh, developing of your pipeline to make sure it's what it expects and how it does and so on. It also provides the LinkedIn that I just mentioned and allows you to also download the singularity images for offline use. So if you are running your pipeline in a, in, a, in a cluster, for example, this means that sometimes you won't have access to the internet. So how can you pull your containers if you don't have access to the internet? With the NF Core uh, tools download feature, you can fetch ahead of time all the singularity images and move to the cluster so that they'll all be there when it's required. And then you won't need internet for that. So there are many different ways you can participate in the community, not only in the NFCore community, but the larger Nextflow community. We have bite-sized seminars pretty often in NFCore. We have training sessions like this one, but multiple different ones. We had in the past in different languages. We had in Portuguese and Spanish and French and, and Hindi uh, and in Spanish. So we very often we, we are doing new training sessions. We have hackathons at least twice a year. We have one soon at the end of March. You can go to the nf-co.re website and you can see all the hackathons and trainings there in the events page. Uh, you could also follow us on social media. We are on Twitter, we are on LinkedIn, uh, we are on Mastodon. So we are always posting content there. There is the NFCore blog, but also the Nextflow blog. You can go to nextflow.io or nf-co.re website and you're gonna see the blogs there with lots of content. Uh, for support, we have the community forum, which is uh, community.secura.io. In this website, you can ask questions and see questions that have already been answered by other people. For discussions, we have the Nextflow and the NFCore Slack. They're two separate Slacks, but lots of channels are integrated between the two. We also have the official documentation. You can go to docs.nextflow.io and also mentorship programs in which we, we mentor people. There's been some rounds and soon, we're supposed to have another round for the Meta 2 program where we can help beginners to, to, to do what they are planning to do, like uh, pouring some configuration, make Nextflow work in the, in the local cluster, writing a new pipeline, a new module, a new sub workflow, making some pipeline work for, for their needs and so on. So having said, having said that, thanks for your attention. Uh, I think at the beginning I didn't introduce myself, but I'm a developer advocate at Sekera. And this is my email if you want to reach me. And let's go now to some hands-on and the real uh, training material. So the material that we're going to use for this uh, fundamentals training is hosted at this website, training.nextflow.io. And when you type this address, you see your URL in your browser and you press enter, you're going to see this platform we have multiple trainings here, you should go to the fundamentals training. We can launch the fundamentals training. Here we have multiple sections. Some of them we're going to cover today. Some of them are going to be covered, covered tomorrow. The main objectives of this training material is that by the end of it, you will be proficient in writing Nextflow workflows. Of course, we don't expect you to be able to develop very complex Nextflow pipelines, but you should be able to write some Nextflow pipelines, mostly because one of the section is writing from scratch, a proof of concept, simple RNA-seq uh, workflow. Uh, by the end of it, you should also be 
aware of the concepts of channels, processes, and operators, which are primitives in XFlow. It's very important that you have it clear in your mind what channels are, what processes are, and what operators are. Uh, it's, ex it's, it's also expected you you have some understanding of com containerized workflows. Understand that you can run XFlow in different platforms. And also to have some basic understanding of what is the Nextflow community, what it consists of, and so on. There are some old versions of this training that were recorded in other languages, in English, Hindi, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. But there's been some changes and updates to the training material so that these recordings are not up to date. So let's go to the environment setup. If you want to be able to run this, this, this training material in your machine, you will need to have Bash installed, Java 11 or later, up to 21, Git, Docker, and depending on the section that you want to, 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 to try, also Singularity, Conda, Graphis, AWS CLI, and, a, and also an AWS Batch Computing Environment setup, but we won't go through this section in this current training. The next step, once you have the requirements, is to download Nextflow. Here is a single command, but you can also type this. If you don't have wget installed in your machine, you can use curl and vice versa. After you have run one of these two commands, you should type this change mod plus X to make Nextflow executable, and then move the file to some place in your path. Example would be USR use our local bin, bin, and so on. So that wherever you are in your machine, you can just type next row and it will work because it's in your path now. If you don't move it to, to one of these places, you will only be able to run next row from the current folder where next row was downloaded. Uh, but we won't expect from you to, to have all this installed or install next row in your machine. For this training material, we will provide, we will provide you with a, a virtual machine on the internet that you can access through your browser using Gitpod. So everything is already installed there. It's a machine with some free computing that you can play with and test everything we're going to do here today. What you need basically is a GitHub or a Bitbucket or a GitLab account to log in Gitpod, a browser to access it and internet connection. So I would ask you to click on this link, which is basically the gitpod.io website, hashtag and the address of the GitHub repository of this training. So let's click here. You'll be asked to log in. In this case, I'm already logged in. I will just go with the default configuration here and click on continue. This will clone the GitHub repository, use some information that we have set up there for the virtual machine. It's gonna create now the container image and so on. So it's gonna take some time. In the meantime, I'm gonna tell you a bit more about Gitpod. Soon you will see a window like this, which basically has a simple browser here previewing the training material. What we are seeing now, we will also see inside this Gitpod instance. At the bottom here, we will have access to a terminal to type our commands. And on the left, we have this file explorer with all the files that are already there to help us with the training material, but also any file that you create. So this is what we call the sidebar. If you have used Visual Studio before VS Code, you will recognize some of these icons in the structure because actually this is a version of VS Code on your browser. So you have plugins here, extensions, everything that you should have in your uh, regular VS Code in your desktop, you're gonna also have here in the web version. Uh, one way to, to test if Nextflow is installed is to type Nextflow info, and it will show you some information about Nextflow. Like the version of Nextflow, when this version was created, uh, the kernel version of the system where you are running this next flow, the, the runtime for Groovy, the version of Open, OpenJDK, the encoding, some basic information. Let's see how, okay, so it's already, it's almost there here. It's still opening the browser, but it's halfway through. One thing you can do here is just close this debug console so you have more time for your terminal. And also you can move here to get more space. Even click here on this two file icon to get more space here. So from now on, Let's just go through the browser inside the Gitpod instance. So environment setup. And we were talking about Gitpod. So for Gitpod, what you have to know is that there's a paid version of it, of course, with more powerful machines. But by creating your account, basically you have 500 free credits per month, 
which is equivalent to 50 hours of free environment runtime using the standard workspace, which is what I did here. I just said, go on, I didn't choose anything. But you can also ask for a more powerful machine. The thing is this large works, workspace option that gives you up to eight core, 60 gigabytes of RAM and 50 gigabytes of storage, even though it's, it's more, it's more um, a more powerful machine, what happens is that this is going to use more credits. So you won't have 50 hours, but still maybe you won't use 50 hours anyway. So some people may choose, may choose just to go to this more powerful machine. If you are inactive in Gitpod for 30 minutes, it will just time out and you have to reload uh, the, the, the tab or the window of your browser again. The interesting thing is that once you refresh it, it will be like it was when it stopped. So you, you can continue from where it stopped. You don't have to everything again. You can go to this link that takes you to your workspaces and you can see all the workspaces that you have opened. I just opened one, so it's only one here, but you could have many. And then you can clean them, delete them, uh, reopen them, them, and so on. One interesting thing is that when you see the file explorer, if you like any of these files, or if you created some of these files, you edit some new file here, you can just click with your right button and you can go to download so that you can download this file to your local machine. This is one interesting thing you can also do. Uh, you're probably aware of uh, environment variables, which are variables that you create in your environment to give instructions to how some software will behave, for example. And what this line does is to tell Nextflow that we want to run with this version here, 23.10.1. So let's type this command. Let me deactivate this. Okay, so by typing that, basically what's going to happen is that it will use this version specifically. We could pick other versions, but this is the version that this training material is tested with. So you can also do next flow dash version and get the version with some more information. So here we know what's the version, the build number, when it was created. If you want to cite uh, next flow, here's the DOI and also the website. Having said this, we can go to the first section of this training, which is the getting started with Nextflow. Some of the concept sets that you can see here, they, they are actually mentioned in the, in the slide deck that I presented to you previously. So what's the process, what's the channel? Here we have a similar image to the one I showed you. We have a channel with channel elements here, they're queued and first in, first out, they're going to be added and removed from the queue to go to the process and create process instances, which are the tasks, right? something getting in, some transformation happening, some output leaving and being queued again in the next output channel, which is going to be the input channel for the next process and so on, or the ending of your pipeline in which you're going to extract the values from this channel and do something with it. One interesting thing is that Nextflow has this layer of execution abstraction, which means that you write your pipeline once, but then you can run it locally on AWS, on Microsoft Azure, on Google Cloud Platform, on a cluster with Learn, on a cluster with Kubernetes, and so on. The scripting language is also a, another interesting thing that Nextflow itself is a, is a, is a domain-specific language, but the processes can write, can be written in any language, right? So here is the first script, the first workflow that we're going to look at. It's called hello.nf. You can click here on your left. Let's hide the file explorer for a second. And basically here, we have, like, if you go back here, you can see the code with some pluses. And whenever you click the plus, you have some instruction, some information about the, the line, right? So the whole code. I'm gonna come here and explain to you in this file. So basically what we have here, I just saw that actually my, I'm gonna hide, let's see if I can hide this. I'm gonna move it somewhere so it doesn't use more space from the terminal window, okay. And let's also increase a bit the font. So here we, what we have in the first line is what we call a shebang. So basically this is a line that tells the script what program should be used to interpret this script code. If it's Python, we would have a shebang with Python. It's shell script, shell script, next flow, it's next flow here. 
The thing is, this is to help the, the operating system to decide what program to use to interpret the code. But because we're gonna always use Nextcode to call the script, this line is actually optional. If you don't use it, it won't be an issue. This first line here, we are declaring a variable. We are initializing a variable. The interesting thing to mention here is that this variable, it starts with params dot. So it's a greeting variable starting with params dot. This means that even though we are declaring and initializing the variable here in the script code, you can actually set this value in the command line by using dash dash greeting. So whatever word comes after the params dot, you can use it to change this variable in the command line. And it's actually an interesting thing to know because we just saw that Nextflow dash version does something. And whenever you have one dash, it means you're referring to a Nextflow command. When you're using two dashes, it means you're referring to a workflow parameter, which is this example here. We are initializing it with hello world, but we, we can change that. And we're going to see an example soon. So as we saw before, every process receives always a channel and outputs always a channel. So if we want to give this greeting to, to a pipeline, to a workflow, to a process, we have to put it inside a channel. That's what we are doing here. This channel of is a function, a special function we call a channel factory because it creates a channel. And here you're providing it with a string, which means I want to create a channel with this value here. Our first process, it's called split letters. It's the best practice to, to name the process uppercase, because then when you are writing your code and it's not so close to the process block, you can easily see what are regular functions and what are processes, because the processes will always be uppercase. Here we have a simple process in the, in, in the sense that it has three simple blocks. We have one input block saying what this process is, expects as an input, an output block that says what this process expects to have as an output, and we have this quick block saying what this process is supposed to do. So here we are saying that something will be shared as an input to this process, and it's going to be a value, the string, a number, a string, it's a value, it's not a path. As out output, we have a glob here, which means one or more things and you chunk on the line. That's what the star says, it's one or more. Uh, whatever comes after the chunk under, uh, under underscore. And for path, we mean these, these are paths. It could be files, it could be folders, but that's the output. Why would I have an output block, you may ask? I mean, I have the script block that says what's going to happen, and then I have some output. Isn't this the output of my process? Sometimes, <laughs> sorry, sometimes yes, sometimes no. The thing is sometimes your program, your programs are going to generate a lot of files and error files, intermediate files, log files, and you don't necessarily want all of them to be passed to the next process. You just want to pass to share with the next process the output of this process that is required to do something in the next process. So by defining the output block here, we are saying that I don't care what new things appear in this folder, but I only care about these ones to be passed to the next process. That's what the output block serves. That's the reason for it. So here you see this maybe a bit tricky command line. This is not next flow, this is just bash. You can just do man print, for example. As you can see, it's a, it's a bash, it's a command line program. You can do the same for split. So it's not Nextflow, not Nextflow code, nothing Nextflow specific. It's just some programs that we are using here for the example, and they could be they could be any program, right? So by saying print if, uh, hello world, for example, it's going to print hello world in this screen, right? Here we are referring with this uh, dollar sign x to the variable that is going to be presented as an input to this process. So whatever you give to split letters, it's going to print in the screen. But not only that, it will also pipe this, like forward this to the split command that basically split a string in, in, in characters, in a, group of, in a group of characters. Here with the minus B, we are saying that we want six characters in each chunk. And with the dash and chunk here, what we are saying is that we want this files that each of them contain the six character piece of the string, we want them to be named chunk underline. If we give enter here and we list, we're going to see some new files, chunk AA, chunk AB. 
if we open chunk AA, we have hello and a space. And if we open chunk AB, oops, if we open chunk AB, we're going to see world. So the string was split in files, each of, it, each of them containing six characters, no more than six characters of the original string. So that's what this process is doing. As you see, it gets a string as input, it runs these commands, and in the end, we worry about these files starting with chunk underline or underscore. The next process is called convert to upper. By the name, you can already guess what it does. It converts strings to upper. It will receive an input file. The output is going to be the standard output, which is the screen. I'm going to write to the screen and want to pay attention to this if I need to pass to the next process. Again, here we are just using some bash commands. The cat is used to, to get the content of a file. So here, cat chunk a it shows hello and space. And then this tr, it does a conversion. And in this case here, based on these expression, expressions, it makes the strings uppercase. That's what happens here. But as we saw in the slide deck, just the processes there are just recipes. They're just explaining what's going to happen, but it's not doing anything. You need the workflow block to say, to tell Nextflow what's going to happen. And what it says here is that I want to call the split letter process with the greeting channel that I created, right? This line here, I create this channel here with the channel of factory. And the output of this, which are, which are these files, these files here, I'm going to write to the letters underline ch uh, variable. Then I'm going to call the convert to upper process that makes the strings uh, up, uppercase. And the input is going to be the output of the previous channel. I'm going to apply a function to it, which is called a, a ch uh, channel operator because it's a function, a special function that operates in Maxwell channels. Soon we will understand what it does. And I want to store this in the results underscore ch uh, channel. Then I'm going to use the view channel operator to see the content of this channel. I'm going to do this next flow run, hello.nf. And let's see what is going to happen. So what's going to happen here is that it's going to call split letters, call compare to upper, and then print the output of this channel, which is hello world. The string was one line, it was split in two pieces, and it was made uppercase. Why we use flatten? So let's comment these lines and let's just see the content of these letters ch. I'm going to add a clear here, semicolon, just to keep cleaning the screen before running next row again so we have a less dirty screen to work with. So as you see, the output channel of the split letters is just a list of files, a list of paths, because we have here a single process that gets one string but it outputs a lot of different files. In this case, it's two files, but if we had a longer string with 36 characters, characters for example, we would have six files. But compared to upper, it only receives one path. And it gets the content of this file and make it uppercase. That's why we had two lines before, hello and then world. To do that, we have to flatten this channel because here is just one element. It's a list with two items inside, but it's one element. That's why it's in a single line. By using the flatten, we make this not a list anymore, but two channel elements. We can view this channel here so that we see what's the new content, the, the new way. Oops. Yeah, no, no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I want to do letter C8, flatten, and then view. Let me cancel this with Ctrl C. Let's run it again. So now I haven't, oh, and I don't, I don't want to run convert to upper yet. I want to run just the split letters, but before viewing the output channel, I want to flatten it. 
before you saw it was a single line between brackets it was a list with two items now it's going to be just the two elements you see one path per line so we have two elements now in my channel this way when i call the convert to upper it will create two tasks one for each six characters uh string let's write it again then i have hello and then world this is the the first script we are we are seeing here hello.nf and as i said these script blocks they are shell script commands they are command line programs they're bash commands but you could have any language actually the next example we have is with python so we can open here hello.nf and we're going to see something very similar it's the exact same pipeline but we have python instead of of bash but realize that it's doing the same thing i'm getting a, a, a string i'm splitting it in pieces and i'm writing two files starting with chunk under underscore these six characters no more than six character characters substring for the next one i'm opening these files i'm reading the content i'm making the uppercase and i'm printing to the screen so same thing but using python so let's run this good same thing happened but now the scripts are using python instead of bash one important thing to mention is that in the script block if you are not using bash you have to use the shebang here so inside this file uh, so next to expects by default for the script block we will have shell script that's why you don't need the shebang but if you want to use r perl python matplot whatever you have to put the shebang here so that Nextflow knows which software to use to interpret this code. Uh, good. So when we ran it, and we have it here, a lot of information appeared in our screen. So what we're going to see now to have a look is what each of these strings, what they mean. The first thing you see is that it shows an Nextflow version. That you ran this pipeline here is 23.10.1 it tells you the name of the next script that it's launching here is hello underscore pi.nf it gives a mnemonic run name to this run which is always an, an adjective and the last name of a famous scientist here is modest yellow it shows you the version of the domain specific language the next language here is dsl2 which is the most recent one and it gives you also a revision ID. This is something like a, like a personal ID of the pipeline. If you change the workflow script code, this revision is going to change. So this is a nice way to, to, to track if, the, if the, the script has been tampered with. If nothing changed in the script code, this revision, this revision won't change. It tells you what is the executor. Here is local. We are locally running the pipeline where we are typing these commands. And it tries to guess the number of tasks. Here it guesses right, which is three, two convert to upper because there are two files and one split letters, it's one string. So here it's three and it guesses right, but understand that these next row pipelines can be very complex. And it's sometimes it's very hard to guess, uh, to estimate the number of tasks because it can depend on conditions, on um, what's going to be the output of a process. It's not always de deterministic. Of course, if you run it again, it will be if nothing changes, but from the beginning before it's, it's run, it's very hard sometimes to, to guess how many tasks will be run. And then you have a list of processes. For each process you have from one of the tasks, this hash here, this is the location of the task. Every task is isolated from each other so that you can go to the task folder and see everything that was the input, output, error, commands, everything about a task. But by default, Nextflow shows one line per process. So when you have two processes, this is the hash of one of the tasks. Here, there's only one task. So this is the, the folder for that task, and you can go there. By default, the work directory is called work. So you can do work, AE, AA, and you can use tab to complete. Let's do ls here. And you see here the output files of split letters, which are two files. It receives a string, right? 
and it outputs two files, chunk zero and chunk one. That's what it, it created here. For the convert upper, we can do the same thing. Last work, F5, five tab, we have chunk one. So this one was, was converting chunk one. If you want to also, here we have the number of tasks, right? One of one, two of two. This uh, sign means it's, it ran successfully. If we want to run this again, but instead you want uh, one task per line instead of one process per line, you can do dash nc dash log false. Now you will have one task, task per line, which is great because you can get the cache, you can get the hash of the task work directory easily but usually you're going to, to have lots of lines like this and it's going to make it your, your screen very dirty that's why by default it has one line per process so here we have the task folder for the convert upper number two and this one for the first one so we have all the task folders and this makes it easier for us to find where, where the files are or what happened and so on One interesting thing also to see is that here, even though the, the string is hello world, it says world hello. The automatic parallelization that Nextflow does is to, to ask the operating system to run at the same time with all tasks. And sometimes the second task or the third task, it will finish before uh, tasks that started before it started first. So instead of hello world, you would have world hello. This is expected. And this is because the operating system is doing it's best to be as efficient as possible, but it can be troublesome if you are using the position, the order of this channel elements to do, to do things in the future. So if this is the case, what we, should, what we suggest is that we use a tuple that we're going, we're going to see soon so that we have an ID attached to the sample information so that we know from which sample ID that information is. Another different way is to use a process directive called fair that will make the, the the parallelism fair, which means the first is going to be the first to end, the second, the second one to end, and so on. But this will sacrifice some performance, and then it's going to be slower. But it depends on what you need, what's your situation, right? One interesting uh, feature is that you can resume pipelines to only run new things instead of running everything. So let's run again the... Let's open the hello.nf. Let's run this pipeline. It's the uh, we are not using resume or anything, so it's running everything again from scratch. We have desperate Hamano John as a run name. Okay, so it ran the first process has one task, the second process two tasks. Good. What we're going to do now is that instead of converting to upper, we want to reverse the string. Again, this is a, just a, a shell command we could use like this. Oops, it, it expects a file. So let's see, we have chunk AA here with hello. Let's do have chunk AA, and we're going to have hello reversed. Okay, so we changed here the script block of this process, but everything else is the same. So if we run this pipeline again with dash resume, if we try to use the cache so that it doesn't have to run split letters again because it's the same thing, but convert to upper changed, so it will have to run from scratch. So here, as you see, it was cached. It didn't split the hello world message again because it was already split. But the convert to upper now is not converting to upper case anymore. It's now reversing the strings. So it had to run the two tasks again. If we run this again with presume without changing the convert to upper body, now everything will be cached because nothing changed. So there are two very nice things about the resume feature. I mentioned it already, but just recapping here, when you are developing your pipeline and you make one step work and you add another one, you make it work, you add another one, you don't have to keep running everything again from scratch. By using resume, it will use the cache and it will save you time computing and so on. Also, when something breaks, you can just fix and run it again with resume and it will start from where it broke, not running everything again. Now that we played a lot with this hello world default greedy message, we can run it again. 
but with two dashes, we're going to provide a new greeting message. We could say NextFlow is developed by Sequera. And now we have a very long string. It's going to be split in, in pieces, in chunks of six characters with lots of different files. Even though we did, we use resume, it wasn't uh, run before with the string. So even though we said dash resume, it, everything was run, it was run from scratch. And now we have the whole sentence reversed. If we run it again, now everything is going to be cached because we run this once already. We didn't change anything else. So now we're going to have one of one cached, six of six cached. Good. If we wanted to see one task per line, again, we can do dash nc dash log fos. And now we have one task per line instead of one process per line. We have the task hash folder for all the tasks. Good. Here, we are just looking at all this that we did already in a, in a DAG format using a, a direct or secret graph. We have some string, we put it inside a channel, a FIFO queue, right, a first in, first out, process consumes it, does something, has an output. Here, there are two uh, items in a list. We queue it and we flatten it so that we have two elements instead of one element with two items. We have two elements now. And then we pass this to convert to upper. That's going to have a single output, which is the screen, the standard output. It's in a channel, but then we want to view it, view it, and that's why we see the hello world in this screen. So, and in this section, having some basic understanding of a next row pipeline, input, output, script block. The output is going to could be the input of the next process, and so on. You can have in the script blocks shell script, bash software that are compiled, uh, script like Python, R, MATLAB, Perl, and so on. So that's a, an easy example of an XFlow pipeline using programs that are compiled, but also we saw some Python and some shell scripts. So now let's go to the next section, which, which will help us develop a simple proof of concept, RNA-seq workflow. So in this section, we are going to write our own Natural pipeline for the first time. It's the closest so far we, we, we will do to a real pipeline. It's going to be a simple RNA seq workflow. It's too far from the complexity of the NF core RNA seq pipeline, for example, but still we're going to have a few steps uh, with real data, no, not really real data, but still. So basically, we're going to have a first step in which we create an index out of a transcriptome reference file. Then we're going to perform some quality controls in our samples. Then we're going to perform some quantification. And at the end, we're going to create a, a full single MoleQC report with the logs and output from all the other tools that we, you use in this pipeline. The interesting thing here is that if you go to the File Explorer, you're going to see script 1 to script 7. And basically, these are the seven steps we're going to go through in this in this simple RNA six cell RNA six workflow chapter. Every step we go, we're going to go to the next script, which is going to be which is going to bring new things, but being built on top of the previous one. In this pipeline, there are basically three tools that we're going to use. Salmon is one of them. It's a tool for quantifying gene expression, but also it's going to create an index based on our transcriptome reference file. We also have the FastQC tool, which does quality control of our samples. And then ModiQC, which is gonna search a given directory and we're going to prepare for it with logs and output files and so on. And based on that, it's gonna create our main report of our pipeline. So we're gonna start simple. Let's open the script one.nf. It's very simple, no process blocks, no workflow blocks, not really nothing. We are just creating three parameter uh, variables, which means because they start with params dot, we can change them, but we can override these variables in the command line by using dash dash reads or dash dash transcriptome underscore file and so on. It has here this variable, uh, dollar sign projectier, which is the project of the pipeline. 
And because we have double quotes, it means we want to replace this variable with its content, okay? In the end, we use the Groovy function println to print reads and the content of this reads variable here. If we run the script, let's see what's going to happen. It's going to expand this variable, but everything else is going to be the, is going to be the same because it's just a string. If we run this other line here, which has a new value for reads, it's it's the the path for lungs instead of gut. It's going to replace this ending of the string with lung, with the equivalent lung. So in this section, in this in this section in, in the next of our training today, there will be some exercises. And what I recommend you to do is that whenever I say it's going to be an exercise and I read the question, you should stop the video and try to do it yourself. And if you found the solution or maybe you got stuck in some part of the exercise, you just come back and, and play the video and you're going to see the solution in my comments about it. So the first exercise is that we have this script one.nf with three variables, the reads, transcript tom underscore file, and mode QC. And the exercise is telling you to add a fourth parameter, which is out there. A fourth parameter, which is out there. So I'm going to open, and it tells you to give the value results, a string. I'm going to open the solution in three, two, one, go. It's basically just doing that. Another thing is that instead of using println to print the content of the variable in a new line, we could also use log.info, which not only prints to the current uh, to, to the standard output to the screen, but also prints to the log file. I haven't mentioned yet the log file, but soon when we are studying the script two or three, I'm gonna show you the log files among other things. But for now, we can use the double quotes, the three double quotes to the remote line string, as we do in the script blocks of the processes. And this is going to write to the screen, but also to the log files. So in this new exercise, it asks you to modify the script one.nf to print all of the workflow parameters, not only reads, and using log.info instead of println. There's an example here in the solution. Pause the video. I'm going to show the solution in three, two, one. So basically, that's what we do. One interesting thing is that you, you see quite often in, in Expo pipelines that we use indenting, like spacing, to make it easier to read code. But when we print it to the screen, we don't want the spacing. So that's why we are using here the strip indent true, because it's going to strip the indentation and make everything just like you're seeing here, starting at the beginning of the line. So in this step, you've learned how to define parameters in your workflow script, how to pass parameters by using the command line with the dash dash, and also how to use the log.info to print information and save it in the log execution file. Having said this, now we're going to the first real step of the pipeline, which is a process. Uh, we are going to create the process that creates an index out of the reference for script on file. So we're gonna come to the file explorer and open the script2.nf. As you can see, the beginning is the same of the script one. We are starting from where we stopped in the previous step, but now we have a process named index and also workflow block. As you've learned already, the process block doesn't do anything. It just describes what the process consists of, but you need a workflow block to tell Nextflow what to do what processes to call. So this index process this index process is very simple. We have an input block saying that it will receive a path, like a file or a folder, a path, something. And we are going to refer to this something through the variable transcriptome. For the output, it's also going to be a path, but we know the name of the folder because we can choose it based on the salmon command line. So we're gonna say that the output is a folder named salmon underscore index and in the e script block we're going to call the salmon command with the index option passing some number of threads the path to the transcriptome file and we are saying we want the index to be in a folder named salmon underscore index 
The stash CPUs, it's very interesting because anything that start with task, it means it's a process directive of this current task. It's a, it's a process directives are, are, are commands that you give at the beginning of the process block and they let you uh, set, define how things are going to be executed. So for now, let's just run this script number two because there's some things we have to fix before we, we go on. So an error will occur because we don't have someone installed in this Gitpod instance on purpose, right? We are not supposed to have all the softwares installed in a computer. So here there's gonna be an error. Let's try to interpret that. It says there's an error in the index process. It was caused by the exit status 127, which is the code for command not found. And indeed, when we see here the command error, it says command not found. Good. What do we need to do? If we open the nextflow.config, which is the main configuration file for nextflow, we can see a few things. One of them is that if we are using containers, nextflow should use the nextflow slash rna-seq-nf container image. Because we are not seeing here any container repository, container registry, by default, it's going to look for Docker Hub. The thing is, we are not telling it to, <coughs> use container. We just use it saying that if containers are being used, use this one. To run this pipeline with Docker, for example, you have to, to type dash with dash Docker. And by doing that, now it's gonna run the task inside a container, which has someone and everything's gonna work fine. Of course, you don't really want to, to, be, to, to have to write dash with dash docker every time you want to run a pipeline with docker. So instead, you can just go to the nextflow.config file and at the end say docker enable true. And by saying that, you don't need to use the dash with dash docker anymore. You can just run the script simple way and it will be using <laughs> that container image. So now that we have the task hashed here, let's do something interesting. Let's go to the work directory, one, the eight, tap to autocomplete. Inside it, let's list all the files. And as you can see, there's a bunch of stuff. We have a symbolic link for the input file that points to the original location of the file. But we also have this someone underscore index folder, which is the output of our process. There are still a lot of hidden files here. We know they are hidden files because they are starting with a dot, and if you just do ls, we won't see them. The dot command dot begin, it's a file that is created whenever the task really started. So if you are debugging your pipeline and we don't know if the task started or not, you can check for the existence of this file. Then you can also look at the dot command dot error for errors, it's going to be registered there. There, You can also look at dot command dot log, which has the logs that you use with log.info, for example. You have the dot command dot out, which is going which is going to save anything that's printed to your screen to the output. You have dot command dot run, which is like a very powerful script that contains a lot of functions that Expo needs to make sure your pipeline is going to run locally in the cloud with containers, without containers, and so on. A lot of shell scripts here. You're not supposed really to 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 meddle with this file, but sometimes you want to see uh, what's the Docker command that's going to be used and so on. So that's, that's the file to check. And then you have dot command.sh, which is most of the time the file that people come looking for. By opening this file, you have the actual command line that was ran. As you can see, variables have been expanded, replaced and so on. So we really know by checking this file, what command exactly is going to be run in the end. You see here, instead of task.cpus, we have one. And that's because CPUs, which is the number of CPUs you want next to request to the operating system to use for that task, by default is one. But we, we could just actually come to script file and here at the beginning, we can say CPUs four, saying that you want Nextflow to, 
script uh, two, we, you want Nextflow to request four CPUs for the task. By running now the script, it's going to create another task directory. We can go there and see what's inside. And now you see it's being replaced by four. So that's what this task.cpus does. Oops. We've seen all this. Okay. So now the next exercise is asking you to print the, 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 the output of the index channel, uh, index process, which is this index channel that was created here. Let's open. So one exercise is to print to the screen the content of this uh, of this channel. So I'm going to open the solution in three, two, one, go. It's just basically adding this dot view channel operator to the output channel. We can edit here, run this pipeline again, and you're going to see a path to this transcript on index. Here. Good. Now we already did this actually to change the CPU to something else so we can see the command.sh. There's this command in the bash called tree that helps you see uh, the structure of some folders. That's good. And here in this tab, we learn how to define a process executing a custom command, how process inputs are declared, how process outputs are declared, how to view a channel, and how to add a directive to a process. We live in CPUs uh, here. In the next step, we're going to learn more about a channel factory, which are special functions to create next world channels, uh, one call from PyoPairs. Based on the name, you already know that it's used to create, to, to, to load PyoPairs to an next world channel. So here, let's open the script three. And basically it has a bit of script one and the channel factory here, channel from file pairs to create based on the path to the reads, a channel that's gonna be stored in this variable. So you have an exercise here to add this instruction to see how it looks like. So I'm not gonna stop it, this one is very simple. Basically we're going to add this, the view, And if you want to pause for a second to try to guess the structure of this channel, you can pause now, but I'm gonna show in three, two, one. So here we see it's still a channel element. It's, everything is one line, so we know it's one element, but it has two items. It has a value, which is the beginning of the file name, gut, for the other ones would be liver and, and lung. And the second item is a list with a pair of paths, which is the, the, the single one, the, the, because they are pairing reading here, we have the first one and the second one. We can override the reads uh, parameter, as we know. Here I'm going to use a star, so we want gut one and two, liver one and two, and lung one and two. And we're going to see three rows like this, three, three lines like this for the gut, liver, and lung. You see, you gut, gut one, gut two. Liver, liver one, liver two. Lung two, lung one. Good. Another thing you can learn in this section is to use the set operator to define a variable. So here you can click on, on this green words, which are all links, to learn more about the set operator. But the idea is to replace the, the, the assignment symbol, the equal one, to define variables. Some people like more one way, some other like more the other way. I personally like this one because I think it reads better. I'm going to create a channel from file pairs and I want to call this channel read pairs ch. So other people that like the equal sign, they're going to say 
I want to create a read pair ch variable that contains a channel from file pairs. So it's, it's a personal preference. There's nothing special about any of them. Another interesting thing is that channel factories and operators, they may have options. And here we are mentioning one of the options of the from file pairs channel factory, which is check if exists, if the path exists. So here we have a link in case you want to see more, but let's see the, the, the official docs here. This is from file pairs channel factory. And you see there are many options, check if exists, follow links, flat, hidden, max stack, size, and so on. So whenever you want to learn more about some operators or some channel factories, you can go to the official documentation, docs.nextflow.io to learn more from them. So the exercise here is to use the check if exists option for the from file pairs channel factory to check if the specified path contains file pairs and I'm going to open the solution in three, two, one, go. You just use the comma, the name of the option, column, and if it's true, false, or whatever, depending on, on the value that the, the option expects. In the end, we are using set to save this as read underscore pairs underscore ch channel. So in this step, we learn how to use the from file pairs channel factory to handle pair files how to use the set operator to define a new channel variable, and also how to use the check if exists option to check for the existence of input files. In this next step, we're going to, we're going to perform expression quantification. So we can open this with 4.nf, and we can see everything done so far, like the beginnings, the validation, the, the, the parameters, the log info, the index, and now we have the quantification process. This one, it's interesting because for the first time, we are getting multiple channels, we're getting two channels. The first channel has a path for the index, and the second channel is a tuple, which means it's multiple items, is a tuple in which the first item is the sample ID, and the second item is a list of paths. So based on that, we already know the, the second input channel is actually the one we create with the channel from file pairs, because that's the structure we have. A simple ID like gut, liver, lung, and then a list of, of reads of paths. The output's going to be a folder, the path, and the name is a simple ID. It's going to be gut, liver, lung, and so on. And the commands that of salmon index is going to be salmon quent now. Same thing about the threads. Now we're providing the folder of the index. And because we know reads is a list, we can get the first path with reads brackets to zero and the second path with reads brackets one. And also we use minus O to create uh, the output folder, which is going to be the sample ID, gut, liver, lung, in this example here. For the workflow, we are creating here the channel and we are calling quant with the index CH, which is the output of the index process and the read pairs channel here. If you run this script four, so we can run again the the three. Actually, the, the two has also the index, right? I think it was the two. Yeah. So now what we're going to do is to run the fourth script with resume which has the quantification model. So because we had run already the index uh, process, it's cached here. That's the power of the dash resume. You don't have to do everything from scratch. You can only do what hasn't been done yet. If we run it again, everything is gonna be cached now because we just ran the quantification uh, process. Another interesting thing is that we can just do um, oh, it's actually written here. Run with all the samples, not only gut. And what's going to happen is that it's going to be one cached, which is gut, but then two and three, which is lung and liver, will not be cached. And we're going to see it here. See, one of three was cached, but then we needed to run for the other ones. Here, here we have an exercise. It's asking you to add a tag directive. You can click here to learn more about it to the quantification process to provide a more readable 
uh, execution log. I'm going to open this in three, two, one, go. It's also interesting that we can always run these pipelines with NC log false. Let me actually put this to the notification. And by doing the dash nc dash log false, we're going to have we are going to have every task in its own line instead of a process per line. And because of the tag, we know now that this hash, this task hash is actually someone on gut, this one is someone on lung, and this one is someone on liver. Another exercise you we also need to click here and publish here to investigate this process directive, but this one is going to publish the, the files you, you you think <coughs> you think they're interesting to a results folder i'm going to it's asking you to do specifically for the quantification process so that only the outputs of this process will be published to a results folder i'm going to open the solution in three two one it's basically just giving the path in the mode here it's saying copy you don't want a symbolic link you really want to copy the files from the work directory to this out here, these results. In this step, you've learned how to connect two processes together by using the channel declarations. In this case, we even had a process with two channels as input. You learn how to use resume to skip cache tasks, steps, how to use the tag directive to provide a more readable execution output, and also how to use publish queue directive to store process results in a path of your choice. In this next step, we have quality control with FastQC. You can just type this command here to resume script five. Part of it was cached already. FastQC wasn't because it's the first time we are running it. And that's basically that. We can, we can open the script five here so we can have a look. Basically, we have this new process, FastQC. It's using tag also. As input, we have a tuple, sample ID as the first item and list of paths for the second one. Obviously, that's again from the from FilePairs channel factory. But the output now, instead of a folder with the sample ID name, we actually want to, to interpolate with the rest of the string so that the folder name is actually going to be called that you see in the line gut and the line logs or, or something like this. But here we have not only a single line of command, we are running mkdir to create a folder because fastqc doesn't create that by default. And after creating that, running fastqc to do the quality control for these samples and to store the results inside this folder. For the workflow, we just call it on the output of the from file pairs channel factory, and that's it. In the next step, we're going to work on the Modi QC report. So we can open the script 6.nf. And you're going to see here a new process, which is the Modi QC. It's basically get everything in the current folder, in the task folder. And as output, create a single file, which is an HTML file. The command is basically Modi QC dot. It is going to take care of everything in the current folder, which is a task folder. So we have to move things there. For the workflow block, we have this line here, which is slightly confusing. So let's create a, a snipped file and play a bit with this channel operators, the mix, the collect, so you understand what's going on. So let's, for example, create here a channel from one to five, and we're gonna call it numbers underscore ch. We're also going to create one from A to E. We're gonna call it letters ch. If we do letter ch view and run that, you're gonna see one letter per line because they are each a channel element.
the mix channel operator basically it combines it, it combines two channels or more so we can do mix numbers ch view and with that you're going to see now one single channel but with a lot of animal elements and every element has its own line okay the thing is as we've seen for the mode qc process it expects everything to be in the folder so i don't want mode qc to be ran 10 times i don't want for every uh tool every sample to run mode qc once i want to collect everything in a single element so that i'm going to call mode qc once one task and this task is going to print the full report so for that i'm going to use the collect channel operator by using the collect all these channel elements are going to become items of the same single channel element. You see? And we also learned about flatten that does the opposite. It gets a single element with multiple items, and you want to convert this to multiple elements. I can do flatten here. And you're going to see it's going to come back to this vertical format, let's say. And then we could collect again and flatten again. I'm just trying to show you how uh, opposite they are and that's why we have uh, the mix here and the collect because we want everything to be provided to the mode qc at once so let's run this here And because we have published here for here the mode QC and also here for quantification, what this means is that there's going to be a results folder which is here containing the reports. We have the mode QC report, we can preview it here. And we also have the output of task QC here, the gut, liver and so on. Here is the mode QC report. As you can see, there's a lot of things from different tools that you can see. And the more tools you use, support tools, the more you're going to, to see. You can go to modiqc.info, which is the website, and you can see the list of over 100 tools that are supported. Automatically, it will be interpreted for the logs and results to be considered for the mode QC report. You can also handle completion event, which means that you want when the pipeline is really finished, it, it sends you a message or something. So that's what we have for the script 7.nf. Basically, it's going to use this ternary operator here. So it says, you know, success, with the workflow success, it means the workflow finished successfully. It could be true or false. If it's true, do this. It's log info, right? So log info this done. Open the following report in your browser. But if it's false, then show this one. Oops, something went wrong. You can do many different things. You could, for example, do email notifications. You configure your SMTP server, and then when the pipeline is over, you can mail uh, a mail account saying, you know, the pipeline has finished. There was an error or not, and so on. This is the link to get the report. You could do this. You can go to the mail documentation here for more information on that. And you can also have custom scripts. So actually many times you want you won't want to write your script in the script block here. Like we can go to the fastqc, we have these two lines, create the folder, run fastqc. Sometimes you don't want that. That's what we're going to do here. We're going to create in a project directory a folder called bin. I'm going to go inside. We're going to create this fastqc.sh file. Or inside you can see by the code here that what's going to happen is that it's going to store in sample id the first argument for the command line call of this script and the second one is going to be the reads create the folder run fast qc good so we can give uh running permissions for the, this file then we come back we open the 
just put seven. And for this layer, uh, first QC part, we're going to remove that. We are going to add this one. We're calling this fastqc script now. The first argument is a simple ID. The second one is the reads. So when we run this, that's what we presume, so we don't waste time. Lots of it were cached. FastQC wasn't because we changed the code. Even the revision changed. And MoleQC also will have to be rerun because FastQC is new. So everything worked as expected. Good. The next part is metrics and reports. Actually, there are many different options you can turn on to get some nice information about your pipeline execution. One of them is the with report, it gives you a report. With trace, it gives you a TSV file with lots of information for every task the amount of CPU that was used, memory, disk. You have with timeline that shows how, how long it took to move files around to really run the pipeline, the, the task, and so on. You have with DAG that creates a direct cyclic graph, like a visualization of your pipeline. And that's it. So it asks you to execute all these things. Let's do that. But instead of using PNG for the DAG, I want to use HTML, which means it's going to use uh it's going to use i forgot the, the, the uh mermaid javascript mermaid for rendering the, the the dag so when we run this command some files are going to start to appear here during the execution of the pipeline So we get here the report. We can click on the right button and go to show preview to see the report. This report gives you a lot of information about the, the run, when it was ran, the number of tasks, and if they all succeeded, the actual next row command that you type, CPU hours, launch directory, lots of information and lots of plots. It has a raw usage for every process it also shows the person allocated, which means that if you ask for 10 CPUs and only one was used, you're going to see it here that you actually didn't need to request so much resources. You have the same thing for RAM and for job duration and IO, read and write, right? You have lots of information about the task also, that the person of the CPU, memory allocated, the container, I mean, it's a, I mean there's a lot of information. The container that was used, so it's a very rich uh, report about pipeline. You can also see a timeline. Again, let's show the preview. The timeline, <laughs> <coughs> sorry. The pipeline shows you in, 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 in gray how long it took to move files around. And in blue, you have the actual execution of the, of the process, like the tasks. You can also go to trace, trace is just the TC file with lots of information about the, the, the run. Uh, let me see if there's anything else. Oh, the DAG. The direct the SQL graph is the, is the visualization that we have for the pipeline. And here it is. Started with ch channel profile pairs and also the transcript tone. This one came to index, both went to quantification. The reads were also long sent to the FastQC. Then the output of FastQC and quantification are provided to MoleQC that generates the final report. So another interesting thing is that you can run a pipeline directly from GitHub. It's very nice. So you can just do next flow run, next flow IO. Because you didn't say any, uh, you, you didn't specify if it was GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab, it tries GitHub by default. That's what it's doing. If you don't want to give the full URL, but still ask Nectar to go for Bitbucket or GitLab, you can use a dash hub 
option in the command line. So here by saying actual run, it's, it, it pulled, it downloaded the pipeline because it hadn't, hadn't been downloaded before and ran it and everything worked as a charm. You can also use Nextflow <coughs> info to get some info based on a manifest file in the GitHub repository. And here we're going to see the name of the pipeline, uh, the repository, the local path, where it's stored. It's in a dot nextflow home folder inside assets. Uh, the main script file is going to be main.nf and also a description of this pipeline along with the author name. Here you can also see the revisions, the branches, it's a master, but by providing the minus R, you can pick a different uh branch so let's pick here verse, version 2.1 and we want to run it with docker so basically in this section in this last step, you learn how to execute a project directly from GitHub and how to specify a specific revision of a project. Sometimes your, your, the, the default branch of a GitHub repository is not master, it's main. Sometimes it's, it's a custom name that you created. So being able to provide this with minus R is, is very important. Uh, let me see, there's something I missed uh, in here. Well, I think that the main message here is that you, the processes are connected through channels. Sometimes you can have multiple channels for the same process. Uh, we can open here the script seven to see that. So you see here for the quantification one, we are calling, we, we are calling this process and providing two channels. The first one has the output of the index process, which means this one has a folder with the index for the transcript and reference file. And the second element, is the second channel, sorry, is a read pairs channel, which contains the sample ID and the reads uh, of the samples, right? You connect them this way by getting the output of the previous one and so on. Sometimes you need to, to mix, to mix uh, channels, which means to make two or more channels into one. And sometimes you want to give all of them at once to a single task. In this case, you're going to use collect. You want ModeQC to write to, to create one report, not many. Sometimes it's the opposite. You have all these items in a single element and you want them to be split into multiple elements. And you're going to use flatten as would be used in the getting started section, right? For the split ladders and convert to upper uh, processes. Mm. I open the everything here, right? Yeah, with that, we finish this uh, RNA seq workflow, the proof of concept, and we go to the next one, which is the dependencies and containers uh, section that's going to help us understand how we have to manage the installation of the softwares, the versions, the interaction between the dependencies that, then, that they themselves have, and also how to isolate these tasks in containers so that we can really achieve reproducibility in our pipeline. The manage dependencies and containers section is a very important one if we think about reproducibility. So the idea is to make it easier for you to install and manage all the softwares that you have in your pipeline and also to try to run that to run them in an isolated manner. So if you think so far, we've been using FastQC and Salmon and ModiQC, and it's a very simple example in terms of, of interaction of these software, but still you have to install them. There's a specific version you want to do it. And once they are installed and working in your computer, you want them to be run isolated from each other so that they are not going to interfere with, interfere with each other and so on. In this section, that's what we are going to do. We're going to start with Docker and we're going to do things the Docker way. And then after that, we're going to see how it's much easier with Nextflow. So I already briefly mentioned that containers are these isolated areas in your computer. I don't want to get into much detail here, but think of it as a way to have a small physical space in your computer where things occur, tasks are, are, 
are executed without interference. Docker is a program for that. And if you have like a container image, like a, a recipe, let's say, already ready for you to use, you can just do Docker run and the name of this uh, container image, and it will be pulled because of local. It's going to be downloaded and ran for you. So we don't have the hello world container image locally. It says that here, and I'm able to find it locally. So it downloads it. It expects to be on Docker Hub, which is a uh, like GitHub, but for but for Docker container images. It downloaded it and then it ran, and we have this message here: a very single uh, container image. It's like a hello world for Docker. If you want to just pull, not to run, you can just do Docker pull and the container name. It's going to work. And if you want to list all the images in your computer you can type docker images it's going to list them all hello world which we just pulled but also next flow slash rna seek and f that we used before so here as an exercise it asks you to pull the publicly available debian colon bosai slim container image and check that it has been downloaded you can do this with the commands that we just learned i'm going to open the solution in three two one go so basically, we're going to use the Docker pull command to pull this image. We put the name here, dbn balance one, it's going to pull. And then after that, we can just type Docker images and it's going to appear here. So yeah, it worked. You see that the, 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 the first part of the container image is the name of it, but after the column, you have the tag, which here is the both sides name is like a version of Debian. So we ran the, the hello world container image. We saw some text on the screen, but what if we want to get inside the container and interact their running commands and so on? For that, we can use the dash IT option and bash at the end to run bash. That is the, the, the prompt, the command line, so we can type commands. So if we type this here, we are inside. As you can see here, we are root. We can do who am I? It's going to say root. We can list the files and we see the root uh, the file system here of the container image. If we do ls home, for example, we have nothing. But by typing exit and leaving the container, if we do who am I, it's git pod. If we do ls, you see <coughs> all the training folders. And if you do uh, home, Okay, in this case, it's also empty, but it's clearly separated one from the other. How do we create our Docker image, this recipe, right? The first thing is to create a Docker file, which is a file with a specific Docker syntax to create an image. Whenever you use Docker to view the image, it's going to take into consideration everything in your folder. So it's the best practice to create a new folder. I'm gonna just call it container image here. I'm gonna go inside it. In, from it, I can create my Docker file. It has to have this name. I'm gonna paste here. I could put here my name is Marcel. I could put it here my email. Here it's telling you from what image it's going to start building your new image. I'm using as a base the DB, the Debian Bullseye Slim. And then inside of it, I'm going to use apt-get, which is a package manager manager for in Debian, to update and install curl and calsay, which are two programs. This end here is just for calsay to be easily accessible in your path or something like this. I'm not quite sure. I don't remember now. You save. And now you can use this command, a Docker build, to build your image. The name that I'm going to use here it's just my dash image, minus t is the, the tag name, and dot means the Docker file is in the current directory. Now it's going to build. After that, we can type in Docker images to see what images we have in this machine. We should have now the my dash images. My image, my dash image, it's here, cool. And I mean, here it asks you to create a Docker image containing Calsage, but it's what we just did, right? This is the Docker file we create, we run this command. Now we can do Docker run my image. And then we're gonna say Calsage, which is the command and some parameter for it. I'm gonna say, hello, Nextflow users. 
and basically what the cow say program does is to draw a cow saying what you said it to say, which here is hello next pool users. If you want to add more softwares, you can just change the Docker file. Here, for example, I'm going to add this command, run another command, right? To download the Salomon program. You can just go here. You can do it after run or after everything. I'm going to do it after everything here. I actually I should uh, open it with the uh, with VS Code, sorry for that. So I'm adding here the run and just using curl to download this file, untar it, and move the, the binaries to the right location so that you can type salmon from anywhere in your in this Gitpod instance and it will find the Gitpod, the, the, the salmon binaries. And now I'm gonna rebuild this container image with the same command I had before, but now my Docker file is different. So it, it will have some cache but you see the first two steps are cached but the third one which is installing salmon it's never been done so it's it's doing it now here it's just saying doing what i just did now we can do docker images it's going to show that my image 11 seconds ago so it's clear that it was recreated and now what we can do is to do docker run my image Salmon, which is a program, and a parameter for that, which is going to be the dash dash version. I want to see the version of Salmon. And here it is. I could just like before run it interactively, minus di, my image, and bash. And from inside the container, I can do Salmon dash dash version. If I exit the container and type Salmon dash dash version, it's going to be an error because I don't have Salmon installed in my machine. So command not found. As you saw, it's separated the container from the Gitpod instance from your, your computer, so they cannot see files that are in one but not the other. What you can do usually is to mount the file system so that you can see it inside. So with this command here, for example, what's going to happen basically is that I'm gonna run my image, the container image, with the command with the command salmon index minus t in the address of the transcriptome.fa. Here, pwd is the working directory, which is the NF training. Then we go to data, ggal, and transcriptome.fa. It should work, right? It won't because the container cannot see my file system. So here it says, uh, here it says uh, there's the error. Okay, here. It says the file blah, blah, provided for the system does not appear to exist. I mean, it does exist in a computer, but not inside the container. So what you have to do is to mount a volume saying, you know, this file in my computer, I want to be at the root of the file system in the container. So now, finally, the... It says appears to be a directory. I need the wrong folder. I was inside the folder I used to create uh, the container image. So now it worked, good, but where is the transcript index folder that it was supposed to create? It doesn't exist. Because even though I made the file be accessible inside the container, I didn't allow the container to see anything else, so it cannot write back the folder. To do that, I'm gonna create a volume, which is the whole uh, current directory, whole current uh, directory there, and now finally, if I run this, I can finally get inside the folder with the results. So now my container can see my folder and, and also write back to it. But that's not usually what you want to do, to mod the whole volume, but it's a solution here. You can also use environment variables to do the same thing, and this is going to work. Now, uh, this step, I'm gonna skip this one. It's basically just like you can put the pipeline or your source code of some software in GitHub, 
you can put your, your custom personal uh, container image on Docker Hub. But this takes a while. We have to sign up for an account. I'm going to skip this. Now that we were able to run some container images, run some commands, make it see our file system and vice versa, what I'm going to do is to run the script2.nf that we saw before. So script2 basically has an index process that is going to call the Salmon program to calculate the index of the transcriptome. And we have a container image for that. But what I, what I want to do is because we install Salmon in our container image, I want to run this script2.nf with my image. And basically what's going to happen is that, uh, oh, again, I'm in the wrong folder. And now by running this with Docker, provide the name of my container image, which is the one I just created, with someone installed, everything is gonna work as expected. And for the first time now, you are running an actual pipeline with a container image that you created. We have a whole section here with Singularity. You, you can also play with Singularity in this Gitpod instance, but I won't uh, spend time with it here. So Singularity is, is another way of, of managing containers. At the beginning, a lot of people in HPC clusters and in some environments, they, they chose to use Singularity because it was safer. It, it, had, it allowed you to have files as container images, which is easier to, to, to process. And, and if you have a cluster without access to internet, you can just have these files. It had several advantages on top of Docker, mostly security at the time. But now Docker evolved a lot. And personally, I don't see much benefit from using Singularity if you, if you can choose because Docker apparently has everything that once Singularity had against it. So let's just go to Conda, which is definitely not, is definitely not as good as containers for reproducibility. Uh, you don't really have an installation. Conda is more like to make it easier for you to install and manage installation of software, but it doesn't give you the, the installation. But still, we're gonna play a bit with, with it here. So if it's the first time you're using Conda, you have to do Conda init, and then you open your terminal again. I'm doing that here by typing bash. So it's going to load uh, Conda, and you see it's going to be the name of the environment in parentheses here. You can just type Conda install and, and keep installing these softwares, but an easier way is to have an environment file, like the one that you're being shown here, but you can also have the file, you also have the file in the file explorer. So basically it gives a name to the, to the Conda environment, some Conda channels, some repositories where to find these packages and the, pa the dependencies are the packages in the channel that you chose in a specific version. So by asking Conda to create an environment with this file, it will basically create some set of folders in your computer and install these programs there in a way that if you type someone, it will still give you command not found, but if you activate this environment, it will be able to find it. But everything is shared, like file system, libraries, configuration. So it's not good for reproducibility, even though it's better than not having anything for that. But if you can use containers, it's much, much better. So here we are creating the Conda environment. It takes a while usually, like a few minutes at least, because think of, think of it for a second, we have like Salmon, but for someone to work, it relies on three other softwares that do some small things for someone. And one of these three softwares also depends on other software to do that. So you have like a network of, of software interactions that makes it not so trivial to make sure one program will work. So when you ask Conda to create an environment or to install a software, it will, do a, it will create a dependency tree to install everything that's required for all the requirements of the software that you're trying to install. So it, it takes a while at the beginning because it's trying to build this dependency graph. But once it's done and it has a list of all the files it needs, it, all softwares it needs to install, the versions, then you're going to see a pretty long list of softwares that's going to be installed for these four softwares to be available and working for you. So here you see lots of different softwares being installed. Now it's the easy and quick part. Like resolving the dependency graph takes longer usually. After this is done, we can just run the conda and list com uh, command 
to list all the environments, the conda environment we have in this machine. Okay, now we're going to run our command to list all the environments. We have two, base, which is the default, but now we also have the NF tutorial now, which is the name that we provided here, right? It has an asterisk, like a star in the base because the default that is activated, but we can both do kind of deactivate to not have any uh, environment loaded. Or we could just activate on top of that one, it would work. Now let's do con the activate. So let's type salmon now, not working, command not found. Con the activate and app tutorial. Now, if we type salmon, it's installed in the version that we asked, which is 1.5.1. Now, what we can do is to run the script 7, the final script for the RNAC pipeline we built in the previous uh, session. So, uh, but now instead of with Docker, we're going to say with Conda, and we're going to provide this path, which is the path for the NF tutorial Conda environment. <clears throat> so apparently okay everything worked we are not using docker here we are using conda as, as i mentioned before it may take a while for conda to resolve so some developers ended up creating a program called mamba and also micro mamba which uses conda software packages and conda uh, repositories and channels and everything else but it's much faster for the resolving. So some people, they like the Conda repositories, but they use Micromamba to manage the installation and, and, of, and configuration of these programs. Then we get to the gold standard when using, when manually creating your container images, which is use containers. But inside the container image, you use Micromamba and Conda to have the softwares installed and managed. So that's what we have here. We have a Docker file, but instead of using apt-get, we have Micromamba here creating Conda environments and installing software from the environment file that has the, the Conda channels and everything else. So here we just like clean the installation afterwards, install, don't ask, just install everything. The name is going to be an F tutorial and the file is this one. How can the container image find the file inside it? We're going to use the copy instruction here to copy the, the file avi.yml that we have here to this folder inside our container image. That's how it, that's how it's going to work. So we can just copy this. Let's go to this folder container image that we created. I'm gonna remove the profile and data. Oh, I create this with the container, so I cannot remove it. Oops. So let's create a new Docker file. Inside, let's put this. Let's save. Let's use, this is an exercise, but we can do it anyway together. Let's build this container image. 
I'm not gonna push this to Dr. Hub or anything. Mm, there's some issue here. Oh, we have to say that the ants.yml it's in a folder behind the one we are right now. It's still an issue. Not found. For the sake of it, let's just create this container in the previous folder. So now it's installing everything. You see how it's faster than the Conda. After that, we can open the nextflow.config and instead of nextflow rnac-nf on Docker Hub, let's just do my image, my dash image, which is the one we are creating right now. With that done, we can just run, see it's already installing, so it was much faster to, to build the dependency graph. With that done, we're gonna, so actually I think Docker is enabled already. Yeah, we don't even need to do, the with Docker here, we can just run this part here. And with that, let we run the full pipeline we built before, but now using our uh, container image built with Docker with software managed by Macromamba using Conda channels and, and Conda environments. In this step, we learn how to create Conda-like environments using Macromamba and also how to create Docker containers using Micromamba. Okay. Let's run script seven. Even though my Conda environment is, is turned on, because docker.enable is true, it's going to use Docker and not Conda. And I'm not telling Nextflow to use Conda. I'm not using dash with dash Conda here. Good, everything's working. But you know, do I have Marcel to build my container image every time? So actually, depending on the container image that you're trying to view, depending on the software that you want to use, probably someone already built this container image, right? So there's a project called BioContainers, and they, they, they try to have a container image ready for every package and version that you already have on Conda. So fast you see, for example, in the version 0, 0.11.5, you have this on Conda, so you have this on BioContainers also. So you can just type this command, for example, you don't have to create your container image with FastQC, it already exists. You just can use it right away with Nextflow. So here I'm gonna do docker one. Let's wait to finish installing, actually pulling, right? Downloading the container image so we can play a bit of uh, with it. Okay, so let's do an interactive access to this container. Once inside, we can do fastqc dash dash version, and here it goes. Let me deactivate this from the environment. Here, if I do fastqc, not found. 
So bio containers is very interesting if you want to use commonly used uh, bioinformatics uh, tools because you don't have to create your container image. You can just use the container image created in bio containers. But still, that's not that good. And actually, what we have right now is a soft is a, uh, is a, a software by Sikera. It's an open source software called Wave. So if we just go to Wave Containers of IO. Here we have the Wave documentation with plenty of information on how to use Wave. So Wave is a service that is going to build containers on the fly for you. You can just give your conda directives on Nextflow or uh, your content environment file or something like this. And remotely, it's going to build your container image on the fly during the execution of the pipeline and provide it back for you very, very quickly. It's a very amazing feature. Maybe it's not so for, for beginners, but still it's very, very interesting. And you can also see uh, Wave Showcase, I think. Yeah, Wave Showcase. You have here uh, Wave-Showcase in the Secure Labs uh, namespace in GitHub a lot of different things you can do with Wave. So you can authenticate private container repositories during the pipeline execution. You can build and deliver Nextflow module containers. You can build and deliver module containers to a private repository. You can build a container based on Conda packages, on Docker files, and a lot of different things you can do here. You can even interactively bugging, you can interactively debug remotely executed tasks as if they were executed in your machine because of containers and everything else. It's a very powerful tool for using container images, for using containers in your pipeline and to achieve reproducibility. So we mentioned a few times already about this process directives. We use TPUs and among others. And we also used in the nextflow.config this process.container. So this is a way to say that all the processes in my pipeline, I want to use this container, which is my image. But actually, you could just go to the body of the process, the main.nf file in your script files, and add container in the name of the container here in quotes. Be aware that you don't need an equal here. You need it in the config file. You can open it again so you can see it. It was process.container equal my image. Here it's not required. You can just do space in the name of the container. And this, this process specifically is going to, to use this container. The conda is the same. You can have a directive just like this conda and give you the name of the, of the conda package and the version. You can also add a channel so that when you run your pipeline with dash with dash conda, it will take advantage of this information to build an environment, install the software for this task specifically and run it. With that, we, we get to the end of the dependencies and containers section. I think the important, like, the, the important knowledge to grasp from this section is that installing and managing software installations is, is not straightforward, it's not so easy, and you need softwares to help you with that. Apt-get is one of them. You also have Conda and Micromamba, which is a faster version. But even when you are finished managing the installations of the software, you still don't really get reproducibility because you don't have isolation for every task. For that, you need containers. And there are different technologies that provide you containers, like Docker, and Singularity and many others like Podman, Charlie Cloud, and so on. But Docker is the most famous one. With that, you can create isolated areas in your computer where you can manage the installations inside with apt-get and conda and macromom and so on in a way that this is very isolated, including file system and everything else. So you can really make sure this task is going to run the same way in my machine, as you, in yours, in the cloud, in the cluster, in a different machine, because it's very isolated and everything required for the task is managed by Docker and up to get and, and, and call them Macamamba and so on. With that, we go to the last section of today, which is an introduction to Groovy, the programming language, which is at the root of Nextflow. So Nextflow is a domain specific language as we learned on top of Groovy, which is on top of, of Java. So if you have a library that works with Java or with Groovy, it works with Nextflow. For this final chapter today, of the first part of the next flow training, we are going to talk about some groovy basic structures and idioms. So it should be clear by now that Nextflow is a runtime, it's a software, but it's also a DSL, a domain specific language, which means you write your pipeline with the Nextflow language and use the Nextflow runtime 
to orchestrate that. Of course, inside every process in the script block, you can have any language you want, even calling compiled programs. I also mentioned that as a best practice, we have process names as uppercase. You can see here again the script 7.nf, for example, in which we have BASQC, quantification, they are all uppercase because they are process names. When you go to the workflow block, you very easily see that these are the process names because they're uppercase. And these guys, that are lowercase, they are functions. In this case here, they are channel operators. Good. The print LN that you saw, it's groovy. And some other function that you have, they could be next row code on top of Groovy, but still Groovy. In some circumstances, it will be useful to, to know Groovy. So tomorrow with Chris, we will learn about operators, for example, channel operators. And with them, you're gonna be able to use closures, which is something we're gonna see soon, still today. And inside the closures, you can just write some Groovy code to do something with every element of the channel. So knowing Groovy can prove to be very useful for your next level pipeline development skills. <coughs> so let's try with the most basic thing, which is to print values. We already used at the very beginning of the simple RNA seq workflow section. Uh, you want to print something to the screen with a new line after that. You can just use hello world. And in this case, if you don't have any option, you can just make it without the parentheses. So here you have hello world, and that's it. For comments, we already saw a bit of it. If we want to do a single line comment, you use slash twice. But if you want to do a multi-line uh, comment, you can use the slash star and star slash. For variables, you can just use the assignment operator, the equal, to create variables. Here we are creating, we can just, let's, let's copy this. Let's create a file called snippet.nf. We're going to put this code inside. And you, you can use Groovy to interpret that. But because Nextflow is built on top of Groovy, you can just use Nextflow to interpret this Groovy code here. This is all Groovy here, no Nextflow. Actually, this, yeah, okay. At the end, here it's next row creating a channel. So, here you're going to print one to the screen, which is a value of x here. Then, you're going to create some why it's not working. Oh, this is going to be here. Okay, now it should work. Everything is groovy here now. So gonna print x here, which means one. Here is the date. Here is this floating number. It's uh, minus three, but fourteen. Blah, blah. Here x is a boolean. It's false, and here is a string height. And everything you see here. Good. If you want to define a local variable, you can use the dat keyword. Otherwise, it's going to be global. By local variable, it means if you put it inside a function, for example, that's the scope of this variable. Outside this function, if you try to call the x variable, it will not have this value. We already saw that when values are limited by brackets, it means they are a list. So we can play a bit with lists here. Lists, they can be list elements can be accessed based on, on, on the position. So here it starts at zero. So list one would be 20. So here I'm printing out the, the entire list and then only the second element. Here. You can actually also use the dot get method to get the element of this position instead of the brackets. There are just two different ways. You can also use the dot size method to get the size of the list. So here it's easy to count. We have four elements, but if you had so many, so many that you can count with your eyes, this dot size is very useful. Or if you want to do this like implicitly without having to interact with the with the results, 
the dot size method is very useful. Here it's four. Okay. We can also use assert to test the condition. So here, for example, what's going to happen is like we are saying that the first element of this list equals 10. Is the assertion is going to be true? No, oh, nothing happens in the end. But if we have said it's 15, which is wrong because the first is 10, not 15, then we have an assertion error. That's what the exercise is asking you to do here. To change it to make it incorrect, I did. I move. I change this 10 to 15, and we're going to have an assertion error here. There are many different things you can do. So you can get you can get the last element with minus one. You're going to get two. You can also use minus one dot dot zero to make it reversed, which is the same thing as calling the dot reverse method. It's going to do the same thing. And here you have a lot of different operations you can do with Groovy code. Uh, here is what you're doing with operators, and here is the result. So you can use this smaller than smaller than to insert this element into the list. Same thing with the plus and the brackets here. You can remove elements. You can repeat elements here. I want one, two, three, repeat it twice. That's what we see on the right here. Here by flattening, we're going to put everything in separate entities. We can reverse, we can apply something to every element here. I want to sum three to every element. So one plus three is four and five and six. You can get the, the size of the list with only the unique values. So here's going to be only one, two, and three, and then size is going to be three and so on. There are many different things that you can do here with min, max, sum, sort, find, find all, and so on. When it comes to maps, it's a different way of having a data structure. Here, instead of referring to values by its position in the structure, we want to refer to it based on a key. If I, have, if I want to get the value zero, I would say I would like to use the key A. If you want the value 2, I get the, C, the, the key C, and so on. So here, for example, again, we're doing some assertions. You know, I want the value for the key A in this map called map. It's 0. The B is a different way of referring to the, to the key, just with the dot notation, 1. And we can also use the dot get method. Also works. Here, same thing. We are rewriting the value of the key A from 0 to x b to y and c to z and in the end that's the new map we are having that's why it's asserting here the equality for a string interpolation we can just use the dot join function so very nice one to to play with uh, so we have quick we have a list of characters and we have the, the this instruction to print to the screen the fox type which is going to be quick and here it's going to join all the characters of the fox color list. It's going to be the, the, the quick brown fox. And then it's also going there's also going to write hello world to the screen. Oh no, actually it won't. It will run it will show just dollar sign X and dollar sign Y because we have single quotes. We need double quotes to expand these variables. So after we run it once, we're gonna change this to see the result. The quick brown fox, fox, it worked, but then dollar sign x, dollar sign y. If we replace this by double quotes, now it's going to uh, expand the x and y variables, and it's going to it's going to print to the screen "Hello World." That's why it's asking you to do in this exercise. You put double quotes; it's going to work. Hello World. Here it shows you how to create multi-line strings, but I, we already knew that uh, from the script block in the processes. It shows we can also limit them with slash instead of uh, the three double quotes.
You can also have conditions in your pipelines. You can use the if, some Boolean expression, and something to be done. Else, for otherwise, something else is going to be done. So we could do something like this. Let's say x is 1. If x is larger than 10, say x is larger than 10. Otherwise, say x is smaller or equal to 10. Let's run this. saying x is smaller or equal to 10, it's correct because x is 1. But let's just say x is 11 now. Now it's going to say x is larger than 10. So this is interesting because you can even have a pipeline with a process that does things differently based on some condition. Tomorrow you're going to see more about it in the process and channels and operators section. <clears throat> Here we're just showing that null, empty strings, and empty collections are always evaluated to false. So because this list exists, this is going to be true. If we just had like if list, for example. Here are just some examples. Uh, this groovy introduction, I mean, it's, it's something you should do like in your own pace and, and running this code and studying uh, the groovy truth uh, links and all the links that appear here, the Elvis operator. I'm just trying to give you some basic idea uh, of the language. We have the ternary operator again here. So if list is true, which we know that if, the, if it's empty, it's going to be false. Otherwise, it's going to be true. Print the list. Otherwise, say the list is empty. We can play with that here. And we do like list is empty. It's going to say the it's going to print the list is empty. But if the list has anything, it's going to print the content of the list. So let's let it run once so we can change the list. List is empty, right? Now I put something inside the list, the value one. So list now is going to be true. And then this is going to be evaluated, which is going to print list to our screen. One, as you can see here, good. So here it's an exercise it's asking you to write an if statement that prints hello if the variable x is greater than 10 and goodbye if it's less than 10. Uh, so write a groovy code that you already have a string defined called x. You, so it prints hello if the, so you, you have an x variable that has a, a value, an, an inch, a, a number, and you compare. If it's larger than 10, you say hello. If it's less than 10, it says goodbye. And you could even do like otherwise, which means when it's equal to 10, say something else. I'm going to open the solution in 3, 2, 1. It's here. So let's do the, the third uh, condition that I mentioned. Let's run this now. So now it's 11. So 11 is larger than 10. It's going to print hello. After that, I'm going to replace this with 9, which is smaller than 10. And it should say goodbye. Let's wait for it to do something. You do to, to be run. Mm. Let's see how it is. It's else if, not elif. My bad, sorry. <clears throat> so 
So because 11 is larger than 10, it should say hello. If we say nine, which is smaller than 10, it should say goodbye. Oh, here yeah, because there's already a single quote here, we should rather should instead use double quotes or escape the single quote with a reverse slash. Let's use double quotes. Now it should say goodbye. And if we say 10, because the else, the other condition, is going to say it's 10. Good. You can also use the tenority operator here. This is true to the first, otherwise to the second. There's also a repetition uh, when you want to do multiple uh, things repeating. This is the for structure. You, you declare and initialize a counter. We are calling it I here. Then we have the, the stopping condition. So while Y is smaller than three, it's fine increase i and do this and then now i is two is one do this now i is two do this then i is three it stops because now it's not smaller than three anymore it's it equals three here we have one example with a list with three elements a b and c and we're using four to create this element list and print every element let's open here the snippet let's run it and you're going to see A, B, and C. It's iterating over the list. A, B, and C. Here you can also see how to create functions. Sometimes you want to create functions to be used inside the closures of your processes and your channel operators. You, you're really close to closures. Soon you're going to see like one of the most important uh, features of, of Groovy, mostly for, for Nextflow. Very, very useful. So basically what's going to happen here is that when you create this function called fib and you provide the number n, you can get the nf number in the Fibonacci sequence. So here for fib10, for example, it's going to give you 89. So this return keyword can be omitted and the function implicitly returns the value that is last evaluated in the body. So here we, we only have one line, but we could have multiple lines and the last one will be evaluated and returned from this uh, function. And now we get to closure, which is like the, the hottest thing when it comes to Groovy and it's extremely useful for next flow pipelines. So Groovy is, uh, sorry, so closures are bodies of code that are passed as an argument to, to a function. So here you define closures with curly braces and whatever you put inside is passed to it. So you would just define like a square, which refers to whatever you're applying to, to, a, to, a, to a channel, for example, every element I want to multiply one from, by the other. It's going to be much clearer tomorrow when you're talking about channel operators with Chris, but today we can still do some examples here. So this square of nine, which you basically do nine times nine, which is 81. The one, another way to call a closure is to do dot call. And here we provide five, five times five, 25. But there are different ways in which you can do that. So here, for example, you have a list that we are calling X with four elements, with four items, one, two, three, four. We use collect, which is going to do something. So this collect is different from the from the next row collect. Okay, this is a, a method for in Groovy. It's going to do something to each element of the list. In next row, we use the map channel operator for that. You're going to see it more. It's a very much. It's a very very commonly used next row channel operator. But here we're going to do something to each of these items. And square, we define it here. It, it it just multiplies whatever number you have by itself. So here we're going to have one squared, two squared, three squared, and four squared. That's the output, one, four, nine, and 16. As you see, we are always referring the element with it, which you can think of it like an iterator. 
But if you want to give a different num name, you just do the new name you want to give and use this arrow symbol here, this dash larger than, and you can use whatever name you use here to refer to the item of the of the structure. So here, for example, we have we are creating another closure between curly braces, right? Which is going to receive two things. We're gonna call the first A and the second B, and we're going to print to the screen a string saying A with the value with A, right? Because we have double quotes here, so we are expanding this dollar sign A variable. So A with value B. So here then we have a map. The key is U and the value is Wu. The key is Mark and the value Williams. The key is Suda and the value Kumari. So when we same thing as collect when we use the dot each here, it's going to apply the print map closure to each element here, which is going to say U with value Wu, Mark with value Williams. I mean we sit here Suda with value Kumari. So here we have another example. We have result as zero. And then we have this map saying China one, India two, USA three, right? The key and the value. Here, what we do is to call the key set to the values uh, map and apply to each this uh, closure here, which is actually changing the content of a variable that is defined outside. So result is going to be result that's why the minus equal means is like result is equals result plus in what we have after that and values it in this case for china is going to be one then two then three so basically what this line here is doing is to summing zero to every value in this map so one two three we're going to have six and that's the output we have here we could just actually do this in multiple steps We could have us comment this. We could do print ln values key set. Let's see what happens. So we just say China, India, and USA, which is all which are the keys. Cool. And then we can do each and just say it. It's gonna be the same thing. But we could at the same time do something like the country as and then say it here. It's gonna be a still list, but each element oh we didn't change it here. Uh, okay, ignore that, this example. So the next would be to change the value of the result. So we can just uncomment this, and print. And we're going to see six. If we had put here like 30, for example, it would be 33. And so on. So there are some links here for you to go further with Groovy. Uh, there are multiple links that I didn't click, but you could like Groovy documentation here, the multiple links in this section and in the others with more information. But for now, that's what we have planned for today. Tomorrow, you're going to see channels, processes, operators, Chris, regularization, configuration, some smaller sections. Uh, if you have any question, you can go to the equivalent uh, prepared channel for that, which is in the NF course Slack. You can go there and join the training channel. So basically you go to NF core, to the NF core website about join NF core here and you click on Slack. This will help you open our NF course Slack. And from there you can join the training channel where you can ask questions and people will be around to, to, to help you with with questions. With that, I am done for today. We concluded the schedule was prepared for that. And 
see you tomorrow. It will pro probably will be around helping with questions, but tomorrow the session two will be given by Chris Hackard, who just like me is a developer advocate at Sekera. So see you tomorrow.